Welcome to Clayton Community Church at home, literally at home for me. Uh, we're happy that you're here. Um, we had an amazing daddy-daughter dance this past weekend, Friday night. Um, some of you know that I broke my leg through a weird sequence of events a few weeks ago. Um, but that wasn't going to deter me from going to the daddy-daughter dance with my girls. And we had a great time. I was in my wheelchair. And uh, we shuffled and still danced. And it was beautiful atmosphere. The, the team did an awesome job of decorating the sanctuary. It was, it was a fantastic time. Us and about 125 other uh, dads and daughters. And it was a great time. We're going to get into worship now. Again, thank you for being here, and thank you for everyone that contributes, donates regularly to this church, or this ministry. Um, we can't do, we say it all the time, but it's very, very true. We can't do what we do for this community without people just like you that are uh, committed to um, sacrificial giving um, to help us. So uh, there's a link there, and if you have never done that before and you would like to, we would appreciate it, and for all those regulars, we appreciate you too. And uh, all right, let's worship together. Holy
If you can, sorry, Jamie. Everybody stand to your feet. I love you, bro. It's nice to see you. But we're going to sing this bridge. And I want, even if you can't sing, if you have the worst voice, I don't care, nobody cares. I want you to sing these words and let the words come out of your mouth. And we're going to sing it a couple of times. If you get bored, it's okay. Just keep singing. It's fine. We're going to sing it until we believe it. Until it, it's no longer just words coming out of our mouths, but it sinks into our hearts. So that when we do leave this place, it doesn't just flutter away. It stays with us. I am going to stop at some point and step off the mic and I want to hear you sing it.
So for the past six weeks, I have been talking to you about what it means to have a meal with Jesus. In other words, inviting Jesus into our daily conversations, around the table, with our friends, in our neighborhoods, at work, asking Jesus to come to the table and be a part of our everyday conversations and dialogue, and really what it means to be community. But so here's the thing. What I want to do now is we're doing a whole new series now. It's called Let's Talk. And the reason it's called Let's Talk is because I want to invite you to join us for a conversation about inviting Jesus to the table of world opinion. You see, people have been asking me, why, why would you even do this series? Because, And I think the reason being is because I have just been watching more and more as you have the events of this world unfold and, and people just not having healthy dialogue. It's like we want to shout over each other. And the problem with this is I see so many Christians, not all, but so many Christians who seem to be burying their heads in the sand. They don't want to get into the fray. They don't want to um, be a part of it. And, and the problem with this is that when we don't join the conversations about the things that matter to the rest of the world, it means we exclude Jesus from the table. The voice of faith is not present. And this message series is not about taking our last stand. It's not about drawing a line in the stand. It's about being able to have conversations that are respectful and honoring, uh, dialogues that, that matter most without hostility or judgment or fear or dismissal. And so as I thought about that, and I thought about what are the things that we're going to address, what are the things that the whole world is talking about? And, and so here are some of the conversations that we're going to be having over the course of the summer. We're going to be talking about LGBTQ. We're going to be talking about political divides. We're going to be talking about racism. We're going to be talking about the subjugation of women. We're going to be talking about what happens when it seems like God doesn't hear your prayers. We're going to be talking about abortion. And you're saying, good grief, that's crazy. And it might be, <laughs> to be honest. But at the same time, how could we not talk about these things? How could we not wrestle through this together and ask Jesus, where do you fit into all of this? You see, that's the thing. These next several weeks, I'm not here to be an expert um, by any means. I'm wrestling with these issues as much as you are. I, maybe more. I don't know. But I, but I do know this. is I do know that I so want people to see the relevancy of faith in Christ. Because right now, a lot of people in this world have written Christians off. They said they, they just don't get it. They're too judgmental. They're people who don't really care about us. And I, I want you to know, I, I care deeply about the people of this world who, who think differently than me. I believe Jesus cares for all people, not just the ones who have responded to his love. I believe Jesus loves deeply. And, and, and so I believe this is a time to welcome the loving voice of Jesus and, and, and just let the Holy Spirit guide us uh, and grace and truth to the landmines of an increasingly polarized world. So now here's where I want to start. Before we get into the hot topics, right, I, I just want to lay a foundation to equip us to, to listen, to think, and to speak as God's people. And so for the next three weeks, what I want to do in, in laying this foundation um, is to kind of set up a framework for ways that I believe that we can enter the conversation um, in a way that is not only honoring, but in a way in which we listen and a way in which we participate in a way that does not polarize, but invites kindness, invites honor, invites listening. So I, I can tell you probably over the course of the summer, if you're listening to us on a regular basis, there might be a time when you get upset. There might be a time when you disagree, and my, my response is good, I think, right? Good in that, that I, I, I want you to be passionate about these issues. I want you to care what's going on in our world. I want you to seek what God has to say to you in this regard, and I want you to be prepared as much as I want to be prepared so that we're not put on the sidelines or burying our head in the sand anymore. 
So where I want to start with all this is, is, is I've been thinking about what are some of the obstacles that prevent people of faith from entering these conversations. Uh, and, and here's where I, I really want to start. I, I want to talk to you about how to be a Pharisee. In other words, I, I really don't want you to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a Pharisee. But when we look at the Pharisees, the religious leaders of, of Jesus' day, they had the appearance of uh, pious perfection, but there was just a, a sad, um, judgmental attitude in their hearts that prevented them from having any relevancy and preventing them from um, having influence in the world around them. Now, for a few, they were heard. Those were the people that huddled up and cordoned themselves off and, and, and circled the wagons and didn't let the big bad world get inside. Um, you see, religious people can be some of the most unchristian people around. But those who take a hardened stance tend to be more like Pharisees than like Jesus. They're seeking power over loving influence. So, so here's the question. How does faith become equated with judgment and unacceptance? Why was it that the religious leaders of Jesus, they were so caught up in maintaining the rules that they lost the heart and spirit of God and their love for the people? How does this affect our conversations with people who disagree with us? And so my prayer is that we have an honest conversation, as we have an open dialogue, as we listen to one another. My prayer is that God would grow our hearts for all his people, that God would grow our hearts to listen to his spirit. And so that's why I want, want to start, uh, in a way, and really how not to become a Pharisee. And I want to just share with you three stories today that I think they think touch upon this and, and show us a stark con contrast between someone who's a fully devoted follower of Christ and someone who is just in it for show. Where do you stand? Let's find out. First passage I want to share to you is found in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. And this is what it says. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now already we have a stark contrast because you see in those days, if you were an average person who heard this story, what's it saying is, boy, you know, let's have two people in the same room. One is a Pharisee. In other words, one is part of the religious elite. One is the one who follows all the rules. One who is thought of as pious and perfect in every way. And, and this was probably what they thought would be the hero of the story. And then you got a tax collector. By the way, back in those days, tax collectors were hated. Tax collectors were disliked. And why is that? Because they, they backed up Rome and they sold out their own people. You see, the tax collectors were Jewish and they, and they collected exorbitant taxes from the Jewish people. And, and they often cheated them because they could pocket anything they, they got over the required amount from Rome. And so they were sellouts. They were hated. So now we got a story between this person who is, represents all that is supposedly good and this person who represents all that supposedly is wrong. And that's how the people thought the story was going to go. But, but Jesus puts a twist on it, and this is the, what the rest of the story says. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Wow, that's not necessarily what you thought you'd hear from the hated bad guy. In every story, the tax collector was the bad guy. But now we talk to the Pharisee, and we can see the Pharisee didn't just do the required uh, once a month fasting. He fasted twice a week. He gave money to the church. He did all the right things. But here's the reality of this story. The tax collector is the one who truly sought after God, while the Pharisee was just there for show. You see, the tax collector was penitent. In other words, he, he grieved his own wrongdoing, or his own sins. There, there was contrition, there was repentance. The, the tax collector knows he's a sinner. But the Pharisee is confident in his own prideful righteousness. Look at me. Look at how good I am. 
you see the Pharisee it toss, lost all sight of, of what we hear in Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The tax collector knew that he wasn't better than everyone else. But the Pharisee seemed to miss that somehow. You see, the reason Jesus told the story is because Jesus sees the content of our hearts. How he responded in the story next, he says, I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I'm sure the crowd was stunned. You're saying the tax collector is the hero of the story? You've got to be kidding. I love the way 1 Samuel 16, 7, he says, People look at the outward appearance, but God, God looks at the heart. So now, here's my question to you. Who are you in this story? Well, you know, we might hesitate because we want to be the spiritual. We want to be the the religious righteous one. We want to be the person who who obeys all the rules and looks good, right? To think of ourselves with this lowly, hated tax collector? Do we really want to be like that? What about in today's world? In the conversations that you hear about you? Do you enter in as a fellow uh, struggler trying to figure out the best way to approach some of these uh, hotbed issues? Or you come in as the righteous Christian who knows all and judges all and really has the heart of a Pharisee? See, the truth of of the matter here is that that, um, we're torn. We want to be the person who looks good. But the truth of the matter is We are all sinners in need of a Savior. And so, what's the difference in this story? Well, well, we are Pharisees when we come to trust our own abilities rather than trusting God. We're involved in our own pride, our own self. We're Pharisees when we come to regard other people with contempt and disrespect rather than seeing them as created equals in the image of God. I love what one person said when he said, we are all objects of His grace and mercy. So the question is, who would you rather be like? The Pharisee or the tax collector? You see, there's a difference here, isn't there? And if we're going to enter into conversations, here's the question, or here's the thing we have to realize, is that if we're going to talk to people who are different than us and and hope that our faith is an influential uh, part of the conversation, we don't begin with judgment. We don't start there. We hear their story. We hear their pain. We might even have to ask their forgiveness for how we've treated them. And I think that's where Jesus started. I think that's where Jesus started. Um, You see, this is the problem with the Pharisees. They hid behind the religiosity. They built a fence around the law and the rules. They were so caught up in the rules and the way that everyone was supposed to be, they forgot about the way they were right then in that moment. They forgot about that they were hurting people in need of a Savior. They forgot that they were people to be loved. Where do you start? What are the first words out of your mouth when you see someone who offends you? Someone who's different than you? Someone who believes the opposite of what you believe? See, I don't know if this is like a time to take our final stand. I, I think it's a time to help move the ball down the field. Meaning that, that if we hope to have a part in the conversations of this life that the world cares about, we need to come and be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, as James tells us. So, second story. Matthew 23 Jesus actually says all his harshest remarks for the religious people, mostly the Pharisees. You go through Matthew 23, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter today. I'm just going to focus on a few verses. But boy, boy, Jesus just comes out, and he comes out hard. One of the first things he says in Matthew 23 is he says, he says to the, Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you. Okay, so that's a good thing. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, and they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. 
You see, the religious elite in those days were more about appearance than about living what they taught. You see, the truth of the matter is people will see Jesus in your life long before they ever open a Bible. And we do have to practice what we preach. And then Jesus goes on a little later in this chapter. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. <laughs> That's harsh. That's really harsh. You know, Jesus doesn't pull any punches. Because he saw the Pharisees as, as those who wanted to keep people out more than invite them in. Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with them and be with them and them with me. So do we have an open door? Do we have an open heart? Do we love people passionately with the love of Jesus and welcome them in the conversation? and hope that they will welcome us to theirs. And when we get at that table, that table of world opinion, do we just start pointing fingers and talking over each other and shouting and make our point known and don't care what other people believe, or do we hear their story? Do we hear their pain? When I look at this and I see the, the, the Pharisees they just missed the forest through the trees. Look what Jesus said to him next. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. I'll get back to that. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. You see, what's this talking about? It's talking about people who, who put up appearances, who miss the forest through the trees, uh, who are more concerned about what's on the outside because it's all for show. They're trying to cover up their impurities, not remove them. And so he, he starts first with, with their giving. You see, back then, the people were to provide for the Levites and the priests. And every third year, they had a festival that they, they invited the poor to and, and paid for them to be a part of, to support ministries, in support of ministries to those in need. You see, they gave a percentage. They did the basic required, really, to put on a good show in many cases. But you see, Jesus' standard was much more radical because to Jesus, everything we have and our belongs to God and the work of his kingdom. You see, the Pharisees were inconsistent. They did their duty, but they forgot the heart behind it. They followed the rules, but they sat in judgment. You see, Jesus said, okay, you know what? What you're doing is not necessarily bad, but there's so much more. There's justice and mercy and faithfulness. Back in those days, they, they had this one rule or law, I guess it was, um, that if a, a fly went into your drink, uh, you could scoop it out and your drink would still be pure. So Jesus talks about the smallest little gnat. And of course, you know, most of us don't want a bug in our drink, right? But he says, you know, you're so careful just to take out that little gnat. But here's the problem. He says, but uh, you, you strain an, out a nap, but you swallow a camel. In other words, the bigger things. It, the camel back in those days was the biggest creature, uh, biggest animal, right? And so he's saying, look, you, you watch over all these little piddly little gnats and little things, but you forget the big things. You just swallow them whole. And here's the thing. You clean the outside of the cup of dish, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. You see, there's such an inconsistency here. You know, I have, I have three grandchildren who I love dearly. The youngest is two and a half and still wearing diapers. And, and I know there are times when I go up to my grandson and you can tell eh, that diaper is a little ripe right now. You can tell when you're around this kid. I mean, and, and I say, do you have a dirty diaper? Oh, no, Papa, I don't have a dirty diaper. Uh, I beg to differ. 
but you know, he doesn't want me to know this. And so he, he tries to hide it rather than just say, hey, let's just take care of this mess, right? And so we do. But see, here's the thing, is, is what we talk about when we talk about the Pharisees, they kind of keep the outside of the cup clean, it looks good, but inside is dirty, it's full of greed. What else does he say? It's full of self-indulgence. It's all for show. Trying to cover, or trying to cover up impurity, but not remove it. So here's the question. If we're really honest, my Pharisee, are you? You know, one of the stories I love most in the Bible is the story of Paul. He was called Saul back then, and he was a Pharisee. And he shares his story, and in doing so, I think he shows us the difference between a disciple and a Pharisee. And this is what he says in Philippians chapter 3. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Now let's just stop right there. Because you see, Paul had it all. He was one of the religious lead. Everybody looked up to him. He was a leader of leaders. But you know what? He said, really, to be honest, it's worthless. I had titles, I had prestige, but I didn't have God. And so he says, you know, all those things, all those credentials, I mean, I, he did it all just right. He followed the letter of the law. He kept all the rules. He said, you know what? It's garbage. The, the Greek in that word is skubla, which really means poop. <laughs> and so what he's saying, everything else, poop. Everything else is poop. I mean, compared to knowing Christ, I want to know Jesus Christ, my Lord. That surpasses everything because Jesus is my Lord. And so he's rejecting his religiosity, his religious past. And now he's holding on to Christ. You see, the future for Paul doesn't lie in embracing the past. Rather, it lies altogether in knowing Christ now. Without credentials, without the pomp, and and, and includes participation in sufferings, because this is what he says next. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. Participate in his sufferings. I want I want to get right in there. I I I know that if I'm gonna really stand for God, I can't just do it when it's convenient or when I look good. I gotta get in the dirty mess of this world and I gotta be a full participant. Become like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this. Which that's really good to know, right? Paul says, you know what, I'm on a journey just like all of you. I'm wrestling with all this just like you. Not that I have already obtained all this or have arrived already at my goal, but I press on to take a hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. You see, this is the difference between a disciple and a Pharisee. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And if we are going to be people who take the table of world opinion and invite Jesus to the table, we got to be people who get in the mess of things. we got to be people who need to know Jesus, not just be ready to have our talking points and talk over the person who's trying to make a point that we are totally opposed to. We need to be people who listen and love. You see, this is where I want to start. This is where I want to begin. Because, oh my friends, I am so tired of Christians who say they love and have no love at all. I am so tired of people saying that they might consider God if it weren't for Christians. I'm tired of hearing stories of so many people who've been hurt by Christians in churches and maybe even pastors. No, I don't want to be that person. I talked to a friend recently and he said, Sean, you're an anomaly. You think that Christ is going to win the day and there's so many people who hate Christians. And I said, maybe, (laughs) maybe. But I know this, I want to go down swinging. And maybe I don't even want to go down swinging. I want to go down loving and listening and caring. I don't want to be a Pharisee. And if we are going to have any place at the table of world opinion, 
We have to be disciples, not Pharisees. Paul got it. And I pray that this marks a time where we hear each other's pain and hurt and brokenness. We listen to people who are definitely in a whole different realm than us. We can see that Jesus can take it and so can we. We don't have to prove our point in the first sense of any conversation. But we do have to love. And I pray that you want to love. And right now, I just want to pray for you because I, I believe that God wants to take away our hearts of stone. I'm not saying everyone's like this. You might be saying, you know what? I'm doing all those things just fine. And I believe you. But maybe, just maybe, there's just a little bit of judgment with a twist of the knife. I can be like that. And I want to pray for a pure heart for you today and for me too. As we go on this journey, let's talk. So Lord Jesus, oh, how I want people to come to know you as the Lord and Savior. Oh, how I want people to know that you are the way, the truth, the life. But I know right now, Lord, that many people don't even hear my voice or the voice of other Christians because they see us as judgmental, mean Pharisees. And oh, Lord, I pray that we have the heart of that tax collector in this story. We are sinners in need of, a God, of God just like anyone else. Not with contempt, but mercy and love compassion and righteousness. Oh Lord, help us to be those people who show others that there is a God who loves them and cares for them. That Jesus loved them, loves them and so do we. Lord, soften our hearts. Pull back our rhetoric. Help us to listen. Help us to truly be the people that you described about. Truly be the church. Truly be people who are disciples, who follow after you, who yearn to know you in the power of your resurrection, who share in your sufferings. And Lord, this is a hard journey, but oh Lord, it's so worth it. It's the only journey I know that is. And I pray, Lord, so much that we would follow you and no one else. Open our hearts, Lord. We want to see Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening. Let's talk more.